Live from Earth, it's Space Radio. This is Paul Sutter, and coming up, we're talking about W first, coming last. And if I have time, is that a cosmic ray in your pocket, or are you just happy to see me, or maybe a little bit of both? And of course, taking listener questions about all things in, well, all things, because this show is about the entire universe. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern here in Studio A of WCBE Columbus. So call 888-581-0708 to join the conversation. And in today's Blue Shift, we'll be talking about the end of the golden age of astronomy. But first, the news. Hello, space fans and space cadets. Welcome to Space Radio. How many times can I say space in one sentence? The answer is a lot. I'm Paul Sutter, astrophysicist at Ohio State, chief scientist at COSIGN. For the next half hour, your agent of the stars. We've got an exciting show for you today on Space Radio where we talk about all things space, astronomy, astrophysics, rocketry. If it's above the Earth's atmosphere, it's in this show's universe. This show lives on listener questions. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern here in Columbus. Call 888-581-0708 to join Light it up. You can also follow along on our live streams on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. Check out spaceradioshow.com for the links. You can also send questions via a link on that page and to social media on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. My name is at Paul Matt Sutter. Seriously, folks, I've only prepped 10 minutes of show material tops, so get those calls in. Before I start taking calls and responding to some of the chats and comments already popping up on the live stream, I wanted to share some interesting bits of news I caught recently. And at the top of the pile, there is, oh, I don't even know where to start with this issue because it's one of those things that happens all the time. And every single time it happens, it's annoying. And you're like, come on, can we just like stop doing this for once. And don't you hate it when you make plans, you get together with a group of friends or a committee or whatever, and everyone agrees like, yeah, you know, we've got a plan. We're going to do the thing and it's going to be great. And everyone agrees. We all shake hands and then you go. And then a month later, someone says, no, I don't think I want to do that. And you're like, no, I, we, we agreed. Remember we had the meeting and they're like, yeah, about that. In this case, it's NASA. And I feel so bad for NASA and everyone at NASA, how every four years and sometimes even every two years, it's like they get a completely new direction. And in the case of this, I think what I'm talking about here is the W first mission. W first is going to be after the James Webb Space Telescope. It's going to be a cornerstone mission that totally drives the next round of cosmology, understanding dark energy. It's going to drive the new round of planet hunting. It's going to be a major exoplanet hunter. It's a massive telescope, fantastic instrument, and it's been canceled. The latest administration budget for NASA outright cancels W first, even though we all agreed on it. We all knew how much it would cost. And we all said, yeah, we're going to do that thing. The administration says, mm, no, you're not. You're not going to do that thing. And it's the same old story. Like there's a lot of congressional support for the instrument. So all the members, including the Ohio State University, which is a major player in W first, which is why I'm bringing up. I'm not personally a member of the collaboration, but I know lots of people who are. And they are pushing Congress. They could use your help. I'll put some links on the show notes on spaceradioshow.com to see how you can help. If, if you believe in the future of like science and trying to figure out how the universe works and you know what, in 10 years, I'm going to need some new material for this show. Cause I'll have talked about the entirety of the past history of science and our exploration of the cosmos. I'm going to need some new stuff. We don't have W first. I'll have nothing left to talk about. And then I'm just going to end up talking about cheese, which while entertaining is not the purpose of this show. So if you want more science, we need W first. W first 
it's like we already agreed to do it. We already said, yes, we want to launch W first. And now we have to play the same game we have to play every two years or four years and convince people like, yeah, remember that thing you said you were going to do? Just let us do that. We're trying to unlock the deepest mysteries of the cosmos here. OK, it's like no big deal. I get it. But let us do science. Let's do the thing that we you promised us we could do. We've actually already spent quite a bit of money developing it, planning it, putting together the science prep and the simulations and trying to understand how to best use this instrument. Let us finish. Let's finish. That's all we ask. Remember to call 888-581-0708. I'd love to get your perspectives if you're hearing me and you want to call and talk. Uh, that's the latest and greatest when it comes to space or maybe not so great this time. But it's time to have a conversation. And I know we don't have any callers right now because, you know, it's been a couple weeks since the last show and I'm very sorry about that. There was the one week I was in Iceland and you all heard the recording we made from Iceland. And that was super amazing. That was mind blowingly fun. And you all missed out unless you're one of the lucky people that joined us on that Astro tour. If it got your appetite wet for more Astro tours, go to astrotours.co for links to all of our upcoming expeditions. And then last week I wanted to record a show, but I had to fly out to LA for a project that I'm not allowed to talk about, which is super frustrating because you know, I like talking talking about stuff, uh, but you'll see the results of the project this summer. And I'm don't worry. I'll be sure to tell you when that will drop. And so I couldn't record the show last week. And Greg, my producer, Greg, he's been, I saw him, I came in and there was like a tear in his eye. Like he's like, he couldn't believe I actually came back and he's so happy. I mean, he's, he's, I mean, he is, he's a new man. He's a new man over there in the control booth. He's so excited. So I get it. It's you haven't been able to call for a couple weeks. We're working on a format where I'm able to take calls while I'm on the road. So on the road, I can record stuff, but plugging in the technology so I can take calls is a little bit challenging. We're working through that right now. So stay tuned as opportunities come up where I have to travel, where I can't record at Thursdays at 4 p.m. Eastern. I'm going, we're going to have it set up where I can take calls so that we can keep this conversation going because calls are so cool. I love to hear your voice. I love to hear your thoughts. It doesn't just have to be questions. It doesn't have to be just questions. It can be comments. It can be ideas. It can be points of discussion. I'd love anything I bring up in the show, anything I've brought up in past shows. I would love to, to talk about with you, to create this conversation, to create this opportunity where it's just you and it's just me, and it's just us talking about science. Now, of course, if there's no callers, there's always the ever boisterous chat room, live chat on YouTube, on Twitch, on Facebook. You go to spaceradioshow.com for all those links. And so I don't want to waste any more time blabbering about the show itself, except it's good to be back. Nice to be talking to you live again. And something came up on the chat room that... Uh, one of the first questions asked today is about this concept of Hawking radiation, about black holes dissolving, about black holes going away. And it's, it's a super complicated process, to put it mildly. And it's incredibly difficult to communicate that process. And I think there's a lot of weaknesses in the standard way that people talk about how black holes eventually dissolve. Black holes, as far as we can tell, do not last forever. Black holes eventually evaporate. It takes a super long time. I mean, don't wait around holding your breath, waiting for a black hole to dissolve or explode. For a typical stellar mass black hole, a black hole that's a few times more massive than the sun, we're talking somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to 100 years for it to dissolve. That's quite a bit. It emits something like one photon a year for a long time. That's... It's... <laughs> It's a very slow process, but it's a real process as far as we can tell. It's a complicated process. Stephen Hawking, a famous astrophysicist, one of the most brilliant minds in cosmology and astrophysics, he puzzled this out in the 1970s. He's the one who first realized that there is this strange quirk of quantum mechanics and general relativity 
that potentially allows black holes to dissolve. And I say strange quirk because one of the reasons, and I'll get into the process, probably have to do it after the break because we're almost out of time in this, in this segment. One of the most interesting things about black holes, why people are so fascinated by black holes, why astrophysicists are so fascinated by black holes is because they live at the intersection between general relativity and quantum mechanics, where general relativity predicts their very existence, that there are regions of space time that are closed off from everybody else, where to escape, you have to travel faster than the speed of light. You can't travel faster than the speed of light, so you're never getting out. And they, at their surface, at the event horizon, and in their core, at the singularity, quantum mechanic effects takes over. So you have a region of strong gravity, where some quantum mechanical games have to be played. And this is fascinating because we don't understand how general relativity and quantum mechanics connect. We don't understand how these two very fundamental perspectives of the universe connect. We don't fully understand strong gravity. We don't fully understand strong gravity at small scales. We don't understand quantum gravity. Quant general relativity paints a picture of the universe that is fundamentally incompatible with the picture of the universe painted by quantum mechanics. And I'll get into it more after the break. We're going to take a quick break. Don't forget to call 888-581-0708 to join the conversation or catch the live streams. Visit spaceradioshow.com. This show is brought to you by Spacetime Labs, the creative agency for science. They're an R&D lab for science communication. We thank them for their design and art direction support for this show. If you see, want to see the amazing work they've done, check out the live streams and the videos on YouTube. And you can also check out more at spacetimelabs.co. See you after the break. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Paul Sutter, and this is Space Radio. We've in, we are in the middle of a deep existential question about the nature of general relativity and quantum mechanics brought to us by a question posted on the Facebook. Oh no, not posted on the YouTube live stream chat by S A H M. I don't know if that stands for something. So I'm just going to read it aloud. S A H M. It's like Sam, but with an extra. <laughs> anyway, black holes are fascinating intersection of general relativity and quantum mechanics. We don't understand how general relativity and quantum mechanics interact and intersect. Black holes are a laboratory for studying that. Black holes are an opportunity to make that connection. That's why they're so fascinating to physicists and astronomers and astrophysicists. And one of the ways they intersect is this process called Hawking radiation, named after Stephen Hawking, a process by which black holes dissolve. Instead of starting with the typical picture of how this is portrayed, I'm going to start with, with a process with a picture that I think is closer to the mathematics. If you actually read Stephen Hawking's 1970s-ish paper on the subject and tried your best to translate the mathematical operations that are happening, because it's a very deeply mathematical and theoretical paper, is to translate that into words, into translating that language. And, and I'm going to do my best. Hawking radiation is a process that starts when black holes are born. In fact, it's a unique interaction between a forming black hole, a black hole that's just beginning to collapse and turn into a black hole, and the fundamental space-time that surrounds it. We know from quantum mechanics that space-time, that an empty vacuum is actually alive. It's actually buzzing with activity, with particles that pop in and out of existence, with a foam of vibration, a fundamental vibration, a fundamental energy to the whole entire universe. We call this the vacuum energy. It's there. If you take a patch of space time, empty out everything that you can see, you still have the vacuum energy there. Now, as this black hole begins to form, as it collapses inwards, it drags, in a sense, some of this vacuum energy with it. The vacuum energy, some of it gets sucked in, forever gone, no big deal. 
Some of it is outside the event horizon and it's just outside and it's never going to join the party. But some of it gets temporarily trapped. Some of it gets caught right at the edge of the event horizon of that forming, evolving black hole. And when you're near the edge of an event horizon, you're experiencing incredibly strong gravity and your clock runs slow. Clocks in strong gravity environments run very, very slow compared to the outside universe. So some of these quantum fields, some of this vacuum energy, get trapped temporarily near the event horizon. And to them, it's just like a microsecond. To them, it's just you know a blink of an eye. But to us, far away from the black hole, it could be a billion years. It could be a hundred trillion years. It could be 10 to a hundred years, depending on just how close that quantum field got to the edge of the black hole. But eventually it escapes. Eventually it hangs out for a long time near that event horizon. Finally, it gets away. And this process, this interaction steals energy from the black hole. It steals matter and radiation from the black hole, which is a very complicated process. It's a very mathematical process to, and I'm doing my best to like translate into it into words in my mind, the way I picture it, the way I picture it is that a black hole is a temporary thing. And when we see a present day black hole hanging out there, it's almost, almost, don't, don't take this too far. It's almost an illusion. It's almost an illusion. The black hole isn't quite as big as it looks. The black hole never gets to be as big as it looks because part of what makes it look like a black hole are these trapped quantum fields near it, this trapped vacuum energy near it, and eventually they escape. And so eventually over time, the black hole looks smaller because it was never that big in the first place. That's not 100% that's not right, but that's the, that's the way I imagine it in my head, that a black hole is a living, breathing thing. It's born, it lives, and it dies. The reason it has a lifetime is that some of it, what makes it it is only temporarily trapped near the boundary and eventually escape. This process of escaping saps energy from the black hole and prevents it from living an eternal life. It eventually evaporates. It eventually dies. So it's that is just one example of connecting quantum mechanics to relativity to produce a really wacky result. Now, is it actually true? We don't know because we don't have a full picture of quantum gravity and the connection between general relativity and quantum mechanics. That has to come later. Maybe that later picture will, over, will overrule this and say, by the way, Hawking, you kind of got it wrong, which is fine. I mean, that's just how science is. That's life. And that's all I have to say right now about black holes. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, your name is Ali. You're saying in the comments now, S-A-H-M are your initials. There you go. Thanks for that great question in the YouTube comments. Now, remember, you can call 888-581-0708. If you actually want to talk to me and have a conversation, don't worry. Greg is very, very nice when he, when he screens the calls, and I am relatively nice when I'm actually talking to you. I did want to dial back a little bit and go back to one of the news stories that popped up that when it when I'm talking about these particles and this foam there we are awash it is unbelievable you are, we are awash in high energy particles that are streaming in from distant sources like a supernova goes off across on the other side of the universe and it blasts radiation out and also blasts high energy particles out some of those high energy particles intersect the earth come through our atmosphere and ping 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 right here on the surface and you can detect them and there's a bunch of detectors around the world designed to try to, to spot them, these rare particles that are high energy, to try and understand their sources. And you can do it too. You can join the efforts. There is a an effort called CRAFIS, ugh, scientists and their acronyms, CRAFIS, that is a cosmic ray detector in your smartphone. You download a special app, and then overnight, you lay the phone down and the same sensor that you use to take all your selfies to post on Instagram 
is also sensitive to some of the byproducts of these cosmic rays, a particular particle called a muon. It has a very short lifetime, relatively massive, pretty cool guy. If it strikes the sensor of your phone, this app can detect it. And so overnight, you're doing this little tiny cosmic ray detector experiment, and then they aggregate all these results together to see how, it, how often, where, and from what direction these cosmic rays strike the Earth. It's a fantastic idea. I love the idea. I love citizen science of getting non-scientists involved in the scientific pursuit to engage in the joy of discovery and finding things out. I'll put a link in the show notes. That's at spaceradioshow.com. Look for this episode and there'll be a link to this experiment. Thank you so much to the live streamers for all your comments and all your questions. We're almost out of time today on Space Radio, but before we go, it's time for the blue shift. I'm Paul Sutter, and you're listening to Space Radio, and this is The Blue Shift, my opportunity to get a little bit closer to you. And I want to talk about an interesting article. It came up a couple weeks ago, actually, and I haven't had a chance to talk about it yet. And now is a good chance to talk about it. The article is talking about what we call the golden age of astronomy, and could it be coming to an end? And I think the lesson from the beginning of the show about what's happening to the W first mission and how we have to fight to keep it alive is very instructive about the present state of astronomy, how we have all these observatories, but the problems we're trying to solve in astronomy are getting bigger. They're getting harder. They're requiring more money. They're requiring larger infrastructure. They're requiring, bigger collaborations, which that in itself is not a bad thing. It's wonderful having these worldwide collaborations with these instruments in remote locations or these satellites and uncovering the deepest mysteries of the universe. That's kind of fun. But it also makes it more expensive, makes it harder to get funding. And if it's harder to get funding, we have to be very, very careful about the steps we make. What if we build a $100 billion instrument and it ends up not doing that great of a job? What if we build a $10 billion instrument and you know what? We could have spent $10 billion somewhere else and learned something better about the universe. It's a really hard challenge. It's especially hard challenge in an era of declining budgets, which has been true for like 20 years in astronomy and physics. And some astronomers are worried that what we know of as modern astronomy is coming to an end. That this era where we have these massive telescopes and we can do science and we can peer into the furthest reaches of our universe isn't going to last long because we'll, we'll end up with just having like one telescope that everyone in the world has to share. And everyone will get four and a half seconds on that massive telescope to do their science. And that's it. And progress in astronomy in astrophysics will essentially grind to a halt. That's kind of depressing, but that's also kind of the world we're heading in. I mean, just look at what's happening with W first and NASA constrained budgets, tightening budgets, and then different administrations, different administrators, different sets of uh, Congress people say, no, we're not going to do that. And then all that effort you put in that instrument is totally wasted. And then you try to spin up a new instrument to respond to it, to try to move forward, but you end up the whole time just trying to justify your very existence. I don't have a solution out of that, but I want to raise it. I want to draw your attention to it so we can at least have a conversation about it. And unfortunately, this broadcast is almost done. Thank you for joining me on this voyage of space radio. Once again, I'm Paul Sutter, and this show is brought to you by the Ohio State University Department of Astronomy. Learn more at astronomy.osu.edu. It's also brought to you by you. I can't stress this enough. This is the most important part. Visit patreon.com slash PM Sutter, where you can contribute $1, $5, $10, whatever, a certain amount of money every month of your choosing to keep this show alive. Thanks to Greg Mobius for producing Dan Michalko 
Michael for being awesome and all the fine crew at WCB Radio for making this show possible. We record every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Call 888-581-0708 to join me on the air. You can also catch the live streams on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. You can also follow me on social media at Paul Matt Sutter on all channels. Visit spaceradioshow.com for all those wonderful links. And thanks again, Earthlings, for listening. See you next week. And remember, science is for sharing. End of transmission. Thank you, live streamers. What do you think I should call this episode? I title every episode based on your wonderful conversation and ideas. And thank you, by the way, whoever pointed out that I had a little bit of schmutz on my phone. Or on my nose. I have no idea what I'm talking about. On my nose in the middle of the broadcast. Thank you for pointing that out. Ooh. Escaping the event horizon at light speed. Greg, your computer is bleeping and blooping. Oh. Now that's smart. Yeah, you cut it. Good idea, Greg. By the way, the, the live streamers love you, Greg. They really do. They're your biggest fans. Uh, Greg wants you to know that he loves you too. Not in that weird way. In like a very platonic... Uh, you know, mutually. No, it is in the weird way. Greg loves you in the weird way. Yeah, John Michael Godier, we should uh, lithium and lithium derived products. We should make a lot of money from that and use that to sell the light at the end of the black hole. I like that. I really, really like it. Thanks so much, Poison. Now you have an exclamation point in the middle of your name, Poison Toad. Is that supposed to be pronounced like a click? Like Poison Toad? Or like, am I supposed to get really excited when I say toad? Like poison toad. Or do you just ignore it? But I like that. It's going to be the light at the end of the black hole. I'm typing it in right now. I'm typing. You can see me typing. Spec on the nosy verse. Man, that one's good too. Spec on the nosy. Oh, now, now I have the choice between a very cool and stylish title, The Light at the End of the Black Hole, and a funny title of Spec on the nosy verse. And I can't decide. You want to know where that spec came from? There are these little rubbery specks all over this place. And the answer is Greg. It's Greg's fault. And he's not here right now, so you can't hear me complain about him. Greg said... I have the best headphones for you, for you for this show. Like they're nice, they're sleek, they fit on my bald head, they're really good. And I'm like, thanks, Greg. You're, you've been in this audio biz and radio show biz for like a really long time. And uh, so I trusted him, which was a mistake. And the little rubber on the side of the pads is falling off. Oh, Greg's back. So Greg, the... the uh, these headphones yeah. that you picked out, yeah. uh, they, they, they're molt. They're what? They molt. Oh. Look at that. Oh, yes, they do. Yeah, they do. And you knew that? All um, time? It's probably my greasy head, actually, that's interacting with the rubber on you that. You got all over your face today. Um, like, it's, it's, well, there's beauty products in the front, <laughs> uh, but then this is left untouched. We'll see if we can't get you some different headphones. See? There was That's a speck on my weird. nose. It's weird. Okay. Yeah. We'll buy some new ones. Okay. That's why you guys got to go to patreon.com slash PM so we can buy some new headphones, yes. man. Yes. We got we to gotta do this together. Go with the cool, stylish one. Okay, I'll do it. And Poison, to Poison Toad, very cool. I'm glad I, I nailed your name. We're doing some experimentation with the, with the setup here. We have the new lovely lower third. We've got the YouTube chat looking a little better over here. That doesn't incorporate the Twitch chat or the Facebook Live uh, chat. I'm working on how to incorporate that. So right now it's just YouTube. We've got some nice lights going on. And then what's next? What's next in production is to work on what's behind me. So we have this step and repeat banner, which is very lovely. We have that board of randomness, and I'm trying to think, if you guys have any ideas of what I can do to kind of dress this set to make it look better, we, 
this studio is used for like bands and other shows. So we can't have anything permanent in here, but anything that's small and portable or can, or, you know, I mean, let's be honest, I'm going to make Greg do it the whole time. Uh, anything that we can set up to just make this look nicer. I'm totally open to your ideas. Green screen, yeah, that is definitely an option of of just dropping big green screens, making sure I don't wear a green shirt, and uh, and then I think so. I use the open broadcasting software for streaming. I don't think it supports green screens. Cuddly alien on the stool. Yeah, we could put stuff on the stools. Um, I would have to switch software to uh, more expensive software uh, that in, that enables green screens. And then, yeah, then I would we would do a virtual set with some cool stuff in the background. That'd be fun. That is definitely an option. That was Greg's idea, too. So I'm glad, I'm glad uh, Greg feels validated. Larry Beckham, uh, there were no callers today. There were no callers. Sometimes, and it's usually, we see this, if we don't run the show for a couple weeks live, people seriously forget that they can call in. It takes a while to, to remind people that you can actually call into this show. So that's why I made such a big deal about, oh, when I, oh, OBS does support green screens. Oh, very cool. Thank you. So I will, I will definitely look into it because we could, we could definitely, because we would just drop, instead of that, we would drop a green screen and then put a green screen on that wall. And if we uh, make sure all the shadows, maybe that's it. Maybe that's the answer. Thanks, guys. I'll look into that. I'll definitely look into it. There are YouTube videos on how to use one OBS. Okay, thank you very much. One step at a time, I'm trying to make this show polished, more and more polished. Greg's not, though. He checked out. He's, he checked out. He's just doing it for the paycheck, to be honest. Look at this green stuff all over me. All right, I'm going to go. I'm going to go uh, eat dinner. Just don't green screen a tree background. Listen, Fraser Kane does all his shots live. He lives in the middle of a forest like the Unabomber. So he is able to just hike out like 30 seconds away from his house. And it looks like he's in the middle of a forest because that's exactly where he is. And he shoots a video. No green screen required. Uh, Larry Beckham, we did test with a ringer uh, before the show, before we started streaming, before we, before we started recording. El Gato. The cat makes amazing green screens. Thanks, Diz Maven. Stream deck, and you can change your background graphics, touch a button. That sounds really fun. Because another thing I'd like to do with this show, did you archive the chat? Uh, oh, the chat's embedded in the stream now, so that's pretty awesome. Um, what I'm going to do, what I hope to do, is once we work on what's going on behind me with the green screen and everything, we're hoping to quote unquote live produce the show where as questions come in, as topics switch, we can put up different graphics either behind me or full screen and in live and do it live. So there's like an intern or someone who's very, very cheap to pay is, is able to do that, monitor the conversation, see what's going on and put up some cool graphics on the fly just to, 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 to bump up how this looks. I'm not going to use space cats. And just for saying that, I'm out. I'm done. That offended me deeply. Not really, but I need to stop. See you guys next week.